Hello, I'm Philip Cohen, here to talk today about the COVID-19 pandemic and health disparities. You can see my contact information there. Feel free to get in touch with any questions or issues you have with this lecture. So before we can talk about the pandemic and health disparities, we have to know about health disparities. Uh, health disparities, uh, this definition from the Centers for Disease Control, are the preventable differences in burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. That is, they're differences, it's an inequality, and they're preventable. So it's something in the in our social system, our social life and healthcare health system that uh, creates a disparity in the experience of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve good health um, that is preventable. You can see a few um, uh, headlines here, um, uh, nursing homes, junk food, uh, opioids, and cancer, and so on, all things that might be the subject of a discussion of health disparities. Key theoretical perspective uh, for sociology of health disparities is the theory of fundamental causes. This explains why the relationship between socioeconomic status and health outcomes is so persistent. The interesting thing about this is uh, uh, healthcare health has improved dramatically over the last uh, century and a half or so. Uh, we've had rising living standards. We had huge improvements that came just from uh, water, sewer, and improved nutrition, but also medical technology, and also education and health-related behaviors, things we learned about, like as we'll see, like smoking and so on, where um, uh, things that improved the public health, that improved the health of the population. But even as uh, uh, life expectancy, as you see here, uh, improved, um, the uh, socioeconomic status is still very strongly associated with health. So the theory of fundamental causes helps to explain this apparent paradox. Why is there still a strong relationship between health outcomes and socioeconomic status? So uh, uh, the, the, what the theory of fundamental causes explains is that in income and education, or what we call socioeconomic status or SES, bring more resources, money, knowledge, prestige, power, and social connections, um, and those resources help protect people from a lot of different health problems, even as society and medicine change. So sort of wherever we are in society, whatever is the story of our overall health conditions, which are apparently improving, um, we still have disparities that occur along the lines of income and education or socioeconomic status because of the resources that those qualities provide. In other words, in any given social situation, being able to achieve the benefits of the society in terms of health are dependent on the kind of resources that you get from income and education. So take, for example, life expectancy and income. This figure shows the probability of surviving from age 50 to age 85 for uh, different income groups, looking at people who were born uh, in 1960. In the poorest fifth by income, poorest fifth of the population, about 30% of men or women um, lived from age 85 after they got to age 50. But in the richest fifth, it was around two thirds or three quarters higher for women than for men, as we know. So this, this following people over time clearly showed the survival in the uh, sort of second half of life um, was much greater among people who were richer. People with higher family incomes live longer because of better living conditions, better health care, and better health behavior. This goes back to the theory of fundamental causes. So part of this is about accessing good health care, and part of it is about the benefits of education and other resources that allow people to uh, have better health behaviors, to live a lifestyle or to uh, engage in the practices that uh, enable people to have better health. Smoking is a great example of this. Smoking and a lot of other harmful behaviors are more common on, among people with lower levels of education. You can see the gradient, uh, the, the education gradient for smoking is very strong, where among people with graduate degrees, only 3.7% are current smokers. Um, it increases up to about 20% for people who have only graduated high school and over a third for people who have a GAD uh, uh, education as their, their high school diploma. So um, this is just one example of a very clear health behavior that we know is associated with uh, health outcomes that is a very strong relationship to education. 
socioeconomic status is not exactly the same as race, of course, but we know that they go together. That is, uh, members of minority groups and minority communities have lower socioeconomic status on average. Um, and one of the things that we see is that the health disparities that occur by race or ethnicity are very similar to what you might expect by socioeconomic status. Uh, and sometimes the data we have in the United States is based on race or ethnicity instead of education. Um, not that et the race ethnicity is not important in itself, but we kind of go back and forth between these two, depending on what the question is and what the data allow us to look at. This is an example looking at infant mortality over a very long period going all the way back to 1850. And you can see that infant mortality has declined drastically, which is great. This is modern society. This is what we expect. But nevertheless, the gap between white and black infant mortality has persisted. So it's still um, uh, uh, more than two to one, um, the black-white difference in infant mortality, actually a greater ratio than there was in 1850. So we can look at the different causes of this having to do with living conditions, uh, which is associated with economics, obviously, overall health, uh, we'll talk about some of that today, the access to health care, and the various forms of discrimination that prevent people having access to those things, um, that might uh, that might improve their health and also creating the sort of stress and hardship um, that is associated with various health problems. Now, even within black and white groups, or in this case also Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanics and American Indians, we still have an education gradient. That is that um, socioeconomic status difference works within um, the racial and ethnic groups in this country also. This education gradient is apparent within each group. Again, this is infant mortality. Um, and you can see that in each group, those with the least education, this is the women, the mother giving birth, those with the least education are most likely to have to lose an infant, to have an infant die in the first year of life. Those with the higher levels of education are the least likely um, to experience infant mortality. Um, but you can also see that that does not um, at all negate the differences by race ethnicity. So that, for example, the, the uh, college graduates, black women who are college graduates, have higher infant mortality rates um, than white women who've only graduated from high school. So here's just one example of where you can see both the race ethnicity um, dynamic and the socioeconomic status dynamic. And in both cases, what we're looking at is uh, uh, conditions where the, the, the uh, situations where the conditions of life, uh, of health and healthcare and economic status and discrimination and all that that entails um, uh, are producing very disparate outcomes by um, race, ethnicity, and education. So we're still building up to the pandemic, the current pandemic. Uh, uh, and and on one another example I want to give um, that goes to uh, uh, helping to understand sort of the social context that produces very disparate health, health outcomes is the opioid epidemic. This map shows the opioid overdose death rate um, uh, in, in, all the, in all U.S. counties, and you can see it's very high. It's clustered in the Appalachian area of, uh, and, and some places up in the Northeast, um, and then some areas which are um, poor areas in the West, um, especially American Indian reservation areas. Um, um, these opioid overdoses are very concentrated in places that are economically distressed, places that have been experiencing uh, uh, deindustrialization, the loss of the economic base, a shift of the uh, declining uh, resources available to uh, state, uh, states and governments for things like education and healthcare. Um, so this economic um, uh, maladies that have gripped these areas have fed into um, the opioid uh, epidemic in those areas. So it's another case of where it's sort of, this is the geography of socioeconomic status producing health disparities. So just quickly, why is this pandemic so bad? Well, it's a novel coronavirus, that's what it's called, which means that we don't have immunity to it. Uh, nobody in the world does probably, um, or did when this pandemic started. So there was no immunity, virtually no immunity. It's highly contagious. If you're in close contact with someone else who's infected, it's very likely that you'll become infected. The problem of asymptomatic transmission makes it hard to isolate people who are infectious. So it's sort of always one step ahead of us, infecting people who don't appear to be sick. And then, of course, this all only matters because the disease is bad. It makes people very sick, not everybody, but, uh, but more than other um, infections such as seasonal flu. So uh, people experience more uh, negative effects, including eventually mortality, um, than we do for a lot of other infectious diseases. Those are the things that make this bad. 
Um, I show this because I want you to see that the United States is in a fairly unique situation here. Out of the roughly 1 million deaths in the world, over 200,000 have been in the United States by far, um, um, a greater than our share of the world population, and more uh, documented coronavirus deaths than any other country in the world. So now let's talk about COVID-19 a little, uh, and specifically how it spreads. When we understand a little about how it spreads, then we'll be able to understand something of how the disparities that we see uh, uh, emerge. So it's spread through interpersonal contact, people being near each other, um, and the, the, the droplets that come out when somebody coughs or sneezes or exhales strongly, for example, yelling, speaking loudly, or singing, and by aerosolized droplets that are, that, are, uh, that, uh, that are not droplets that sort of are wet and fly through the air, but tiny droplets that can linger in the air. So it's, it's whenever people are near each other, um, uh, and the longer they are together, um, and the closer they are together, and the less ventilation and airflow there is around them, it's like indoors versus outdoors, um, this is how the pandemic spreads. A key thing also is that asymptomatic patients, patients who don't know they're sick, can be infectious and spread the virus. So um, essentially what we're going to find is that people who are separated from others um, are least likely to get this disease, and people who are close to others um, are most likely to get it. And then uh, we'll also see that the outcomes are partly dependent on the kind of healthcare that people have. So some of the dynamics of how this has evolved in the United States, um, one, one, one uh, institutional setting where we've seen um, uh, outbreaks that help us see how this epidemic works and also how we have failed to stop it are settings where people are close together, especially people who have um, uh, possibly compromised health or not good health. Nursing homes are by far have been the worst. Um, something like 40% of all um, deaths from coronavirus have occurred in and around nursing homes. Uh, over 77,000 people in the United States have died, um, either nursing home patients or staff uh, who work in the facility. So just devastating, including in small towns and rural areas where um, uh, the, often the, the epicenter, the local epicenter in many rural counties has been a nursing home. Also have seen shockingly large epidemic outbreaks um, in prisons among both prisoners and staff. Over 200,000 infections and 1,265 deaths as of a recent count by the New York Times. Here's a list above me, a list of uh, some of the specific cases. 3,000 uh, people tested positive in Avenel State Prison in California, 2,500 in San Quentin in California, just thousands of people in prisons. And prisons are churning. People are coming and going from prisons. And so the epidemic is coming in and going out as prisoners come and go and as workers come and go. So these have been a big, uh, a big driver um, in, in our country. And then similar situation uh, occurs in factories. We have a lot of people who are close together, uh, working hard, breathing uh, all over each other for extended periods of time. And we've seen some big outbreaks in places like meatpacking plants, especially you can see there, uh, the meatpacking uh, Smithfield plant in South Dakota, the Tyson Foods plant in Iowa, over a thousand cases each, and many, many other examples of uh, outbreaks in factories. So all these are cases where close together, breathing on each other, and then it's worse when people uh, have health impairments or health problems in addition. So we see places where we might see health disparities along the lines of what we saw uh, uh, discussing earlier um, uh, that might be coming up in this pandemic. Physically concentrated places like nursing homes and factories and prisons, places where people have health status that puts them at greater risk of negative effects of this disease, which is a respiratory illness. So people who have, for example, asthma or high blood pressure or compromised immunity of some kind um, are at greater risk of having a negative outcome if they are infected. And then a lot of what we see is people who are exposed in and around their workplaces. Healthcare workers, obviously the most obvious uh, people at risk, but also service workers, uh, people whose jobs put them in close contact with the public, and then workers who work at work instead of working at home, as I am doing right now. People who can't work at home are just at greater risk because they're out interacting with more people just in order to have a livelihood. Just to see uh, how the inequality in work is translating into inequality in working at home, which puts people um, in a safer position vis-a-vis um, -vis the pandemic instead of working out and about, which is where people are at greater risk. I put this together to show um, uh, uh, the, some large occupations or occupation groups of occupations. And you can see these higher paid occupations, computer and math occupations, 
um, lawyers, architects and engineers, managers, science occupations, those higher paid jobs that pay over $1,500 a week um, have very high rates of people who are currently teleworking, people who are working at home because of the pandemic. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has been asking this question, are you working at home because of the pandemic? And so in these occupations like computer and math occupations, um, over 60% of people say, yes, I've been working at home at least some of the time because of the pandemic. All the way down at the bottom of the income scale here, down around five or six hundred dollars a week, I'm um, paid food service jobs, healthcare support, personal care, building and grounds workers. These are not jobs you can do at home, and these people are not doing those jobs at home. So under ten percent of them are, are working at home. People who have these occupations, so they have less money, and they have jobs that put them at greater risk. They literally are out doing their jobs um, at, that involve interacting with other people. Um, jobs like truck driving and driving buses and um, uh, working in sales and office support jobs and so on. So we see working class jobs are just putting people at greater risk and it's the middle class um, and higher status jobs that are allowing people to stay home where it's safer um, and where they're just less likely to get infected by the pandemic. So that occupational disparity boils down to what we can see an education gradient in working at home. So I, I do this to draw to to harken back to the discussion uh, earlier about smoking or about opioids, where we know people who are in uh, have harder economic times, people who have uh, less education are are more likely to have behaviors, which are not necessarily things that they're choosing, as in this case, that put them at greater risk for uh, health problems and create health disparities. So when you look at that occupational distribution of who can work at home, you see this very strong gradient by education in the percent working at home, where 50% of people with advanced degrees, such as me, are doing their jobs at home, at least part of the time, and all the way down to workers with less than a high school education, only 4% are able to work at home. So uh, uh, just like smoking, this is a case where the behavior, in this case, working outside the home, uh, that puts people at risk is concentrated among people who have less education. Now, this is not all happening uh, in a vacuum as far as our government and our government policies. And in particular, we have a very um, a serious problem that workers who literally are sick have to go to work or they will lose their jobs. Um, and uh, so we have a problem with, uh, with trying to stop the pandemic that we're literally pushing people into the workplace when they are sick. The CDC came out with clear instructions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And at the top of the list is to stay home when you're sick. But a lot of American workers don't have that option. 27% of private sector workers don't get paid sick leave. And that's gonna make this pandemic a lot more problematic than it needs to be. Over 30 million workers in the U.S. don't get paid sick days. That's not the way it has to be. The U.S. is one of only two OECD countries without federally mandated paid sick leave. So taking off can mean you can't pay your bills, and calling sick can get you fired. So what does that mean when there's a highly contagious disease circulating, like right now? It means people who are sick may be going to work and risking infecting their coworkers, their customers, the people they teach, or the people they care for. And it gets worse. Those 30 million or so people without paid sick leave, they're most concentrated in low-wage jobs and in industries that are the most likely to involve the risk of contagion. Restaurant workers, hotel workers, people who work in transportation, travel, and tourism. Less than half of Americans doing restaurant, leisure, and hospitality work have paid sick leave. And for the bottom 10% of wage earners overall, only 30% do. With the coronavirus crisis we're going through today, paid sick leave isn't just the right policy for workers, it's essential to our public health. So unsurprisingly, when you look at the kinds of occupations people have, the kind of health conditions they have, the type of work they're doing, and the, the lack of protections that a lot of people have at work, you can imagine we're going to see some disparate impacts of the coronavirus epidemic. Um, this shows um, how extreme those differences can be. These are the COVID-19 death rates. So these are deaths out of every 100,000 people in each age and race et ethnic group have died from the pandemic. And you can see that in each group, um, people with uh, uh, older age are more likely to have died. So that's, that's what we know about how the disease works. It's more harmful to older people. But the disparity between Black, Hispanic, especially Black and Hispanic versus white, um, uh, death rates is very large when you look within the age groups. 
Um, and, and especially, it's a little hard to tell in the figure, uh, it's why I called it out that where the rates are lower, the people under 65, so age 18 to 65, that's where the disparities are the largest in terms of death rates, where Black and Hispanic uh, uh, individuals have death rates of five to eight times higher than, than white people of the same age group. So very disparate impact in that case, which I think we can trace back to um, not only um, uh, pre-existing health conditions and so on, but also those conditions of work um, and the inability to work at home. And yes, if you're, if you're looking in shock at these numbers, that number for uh, black uh, people over age 85 is 1,600 out of 100,000. That means 1.6% of all uh, black Americans over age 85 have died from coronavirus. So just absolutely astounding, devastating and terrible um, death rates at older ages, especially among um, Black and Hispanic people. So what can we learn from the fundamental cause theory to help us understand the coronavirus pandemic? Um, well, um, poor resources, so the kind of jobs and education and money and where people live, all of that affects the living conditions. Um, lower education and also discrimination affects what kind of jobs people have. Um, and these things put people at different amounts of risk. On top of that, the workplace policies such as sick leave, as we saw, leaves some people more vulnerable or the ability to work at home versus having to go out and work with the public, leaves different groups more vulnerable. We saw big disparities there. And then poor health care or lack of health care affect the outcomes once people are affected. And you don't have to look any further uh, than the president uh, and his associates to see that, that they have, uh, they were reckless and took all kinds of risks and got infected and then have had great health care to help them deal with the outcomes. So um, the, the disparate uh, impact is partly by do you get it and partly how sick are you or how healthy are you at the time you get it and then what resources, including healthcare resources, do you have to deal with um, the, uh, the infection, to deal with being sick. So all of this affects um, disparate Black and Hispanic uh, impact of the pandemic as well as other disparities such as education and income.